Thank you, Ms. Gaikid. Tenakoto Katoa, the Anglican Church, our care organisations, and schools of an Anglican nature very much look forward to your future recommendations. In the Archbishop's statement to you, or the response to the Section 20 notice, uh, they said at Para 9, our experiences with the Royal Commission have also taught us a sharp lesson that we were too trusting of individuals. It was this trust and presumption that everyone within the church is good at heart that contributed to the failure to address our mistakes sooner. They were not alone in that failing. And much of the evidence of the last few days has dealt with pedophiles. And people who sexually abuse children are by their nature cunning, manipulative, sometimes charming. We heard the reference to the offender with the gift of the gab. They don't come with big flashing lights and warning signs. They quietly move. They will always exist in our society and they are attracted to places where there are potential victims. And I know you have dealt with cases like Maryland, places where there are particular vulnerabilities. So how does one assess character of people we put into these places? How do you identify a pedophile? It's almost, almost impossible at the outset. It is not easy. Everyone always has a first time, as, as, as we know. As this Royal Commission has learned, their victims are also often those who are least able to stop what is happening. They are often isolated, threatened, scared, ashamed. That is how pedophiles operate. So what I wanted to address, and these were just some reflections about how we can prevent abuse, And I'd suggest it is about a number of things. Firstly, reducing or eliminating opportunities for people to offend. Really importantly, it's about increasing the knowledge and the capacity of the faith community as a whole, and indeed community as a whole, so that we can identify and look out for suspicious behaviour when we see it, so we can protect our young and vulnerable, that, so that we can be open to hearing about it and believing it. Not all of us have grown up or been involved in work where this is what we do and what we know. What we need to do to prevent abuse is to educate all New Zealanders about abuse and sexual abuse and its dynamics, how it works. Simple things just as the delay in reporting. We also believe that what is needed is a deep understanding of Māori, Pacifica and other cultural beliefs and frameworks, how people view the world because that affects why abuse happens, why it is not stopped, why people don't speak up. So people in positions of power and governance and all of us need to understand that. And where there is a legitimate need for and an interest in communications about abuse, and I'm talking about situations that we've heard about today between a school and a bishop, between parents and a school, with the police, what needs to be is that there's honest and frank communications about what has happened. Not euphemisms, not suggestions and innuendo, but flacks that we feel comfortable to talk about this where it is needed. So there are not barriers in the way of honest communications. We need to strengthen and embolden our tamariki 
so they can speak up and know they will be supported. And that's all of us need to do that as parents, as leaders in a church, leaders in our community. We believe, and I know that I echo the view of one of the uh, survivors groups with, in relation to faith-based institutions, that the state must take an interest in children wherever they are. An equal interest. It is always the state's responsibility to ensure the welfare of New Zealand children. And one example of that is uh, Mr Reddick's the headmaster today supporting the suggestion that there should be the same ERO report, same extension to children who are in independent schools uh, as there is to children in state schools. And finally, and most importantly, we must place our children and our vulnerable people at the centre of all of our decision making. They must be the centre of when we make decisions, we think about how will it affect our children. We must keep their interests central. In that regard, on this topic of preventing abuse, we have learned today of the petition that you have received. And I've only had an opportunity to speak to the primates, but they personally, the two archbishops, support the request in the petition for a law change requiring mandatory reporting of abuse. And there will be an education process that needs to go with that, that's a sweeping change but it's supported by them. And now I turn to redress. And where abuse happens, there must be healing. There must be restoration of the tapu and mana of the person. And we believe this will only occur in a context of deep respect for survivors. What needs to be sought and created in a redress process is a sense of healing and wholeness for the survivor. It is not easy. Uh, sometimes for survivors of abuse within faith-based settings, the survivor wants to reconcile to their faith. for them that has a significant spiritual aspect or at the very least reconnect with places and people of significance in their life. We do hope that the state system will have the Matarangi needed to effect full redress to enable survivors to fulfil their potential in life. We have identified our concerns in the hope that those who are entrusted to engage and create this important new process hear and embrace what is needed so that it is much, much more than another system without soul that survivors uh, will engage with. And with that, Wero, we leave you. We thank you for your work. Thank you very much, Ms. Gaikid. And thank you, as for everybody else, um, for your appearances throughout the uh, Commission's work uh, and for the other members of your team, Mr. Gray, who's not here today, but the other members who've supported you and your clients. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>